Oh, tēnā koutou. Uh, firstly, big thanks to Gary and um, Raywin and the EDS crew for having me here today to talk about the tsunami that we are faced with. Um, yeah, it's something I'm very passionate about and it's an honour for me to bring what I'm seeing out there forward to everyone here in the room so that we can act fast because we have to. If we leave it any longer, the next generation will not be able to deal with it. Um, can I see a show of hands of anyone that disagrees with uh, George Mombia and uh, Rod Oram about the need to rewild our landscapes or the need to switch to a plant-based diet urgently? <laughs> All right, we've got one, two. Oh, there's a couple there, cool. Um, yeah, so I'll get on with it. I've got 10 minutes, so I'll try and squeeze it all in. Facing the tsunami, this is our biggest threat. It's on the way. I'm not going to talk to you about the unlined effluent ponds in the Bay of Plenty and the fact that the regional councillor is dumping his effluent into a river which goes into the Waiotahi estuary where children and people are harvesting kai. We're not going to talk about that today. Um, you guys know all about agriculture and how it's a big problem. Here's some of those eutrophic events that's down in the South Island. We're not going to go into detail about how that is uh, you know, a big problem. I think we all know about that. And, uh, and I don't think we need to talk about our animal welfare or our agency uh, failure and the, the, reason, the ways that our agencies get captured by big industries and uh, big polluting industries. Uh, this is a recent shot from down the South Island, just a classic rubbish dump out the back of a farm. Right, so I want to talk to you about our forests and the ability that they have to regenerate our landscapes. Uh, they've been doing it for millennia. They've been faced with fires, floods, volcanic events, earthquakes, uh, you know, massive weather events, climate change essentially. They are resilient if we keep them healthy and if we allow them to do what they are designed to do. This is in Puriora. This is one of our flagship podocarp forests. It's an amazing place to go and learn and observe nature you know, at, its, at its sort of best, you know, an original place. Um, this is the Waipoa, beautiful Cody forest. We're so lucky to have virgin forest left over and, you know, that, that we can study and we can understand. But there is a really, really big threat coming and that is invasive weeds. So this is Aotearoa fully cloaked. Um, about 30% of the forests were, you know, the lowland drought prone forests were burnt and cleared by early Māori, early Polynesians. and. Uh, you know, when the Europeans arrived, we took out about a third, another, another third of our landscape. So all the marginal hill country, um, bulldozed it, burnt it, cleared it to make way for, you know, farming, make way for agriculture. And we left with about 30% of nature left, you know, that's 15% or so of, of, uh, of our indigenous forests and alpine, alpine areas. And we've got this potential now with uh, this class 6, 7E erosion prone land that's not really adding much uh, benefit to the farming business as a nation. And this is it identified here. So we could rewild this much of Aotearoa, um, you know, but we're not going to get there if we don't address the big problem, which is weeds and pests. So yeah, that's what Aotearoa could look like. That's what we could be, could be moving into. So here's a, here's a quick little meme. Um, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of focus on the planting, virtually no focus on maintenance. And so you've seen the slips down the east coast. You've seen, you've seen what damage can be done when we fragment our ecosystems and put our forests in little, little uh, areas. Where, you know, it, doesn't, it cannot uh, rehabilitate the land. This is, a farm where the farmer's obviously doing the right thing here by fencing off a, a gully where there's some beautiful kahikatea. And uh, unfortunately, from down along that hedgerow at the back, the privet has spread into here and absolutely taken over that area. Now, privet and all sorts of weeds are spreading across our landscapes. This is Chinese privet on Waka Kotahi NZTA land on the Coromandel, hopping down the roadsides. Uh, it's jumped over the fence into a forestry block. That forestry block has been logged, and the first plants to come up are the invasive weeds. So the, the plants, as, as Palmer McGowan said, that have the ability to heal us are the ones that also heal the land, and they are the ones that are at threat 
with the invasive weed onslaught. So you can see what this privet's doing, a little bit of cherry in there too. This bit of land is never going to turn back into native forest unless we do massive amount of work. This is flowering privet again going down a waterway. Animals have been excluded, um, which is a big worry because all of our riparian plantings are now turning into weed dispersal corridors. And it's not just the roadsides or the rail corridors. Now we're planting out our riparian zones. Without animals grazing those weeds down, we're just using, they're just becoming weed dispersal corridors, which they'll spread across our whole landscapes, end up in our national parks, end up in our last forest remnants, and totally disable the ability for our, this country to repair itself when there's events, you know, and to rewild itself. This is Jasmine climbing up a eucalypt on the side of the road. Um, yeah, this is a bit of ivy climbing up a willow there. Uh, arum lily, shade tolerant lily that can smother and choke out any native species coming up. There's a bit of woolly nightshade there. And then again, you've got your flowering Chinese privet. And if you look in the under, under canopy of this Chinese privet, you can see one of our, one of our worst uh, vines and creepers, which is climbing asparagus. And I don't know if anyone in the room here has tried to deal with this plant. It takes years and years to even get it into a, a level where you can feel like you're controlling it. Um, walking through the bush with eight or, eight or ten guys two metres apart carrying ten litres of herbicide, spot spraying every last seedling to eradicate it out of the conservation estate is something that gives me nightmares, but that's the reality, that's what we have to do. So every year we let these plants go to seed, every dollar we don't want to spend costs us hundreds and hundreds down the line. This is just the reality of going into a, you know, a pretty well established bush. Uh, there's a lot of uh, thinking around planting and getting canopy cover and then jobs done, walk away, we've planted our trees, we've, we're farming our carbon now but really we're making the problem worse if we don't address these shade tolerant weeds or other environmental weeds. And you can see nothing really has a chance at coming up underneath this forest. When the mature trees fall down, there's no, there's no seedlings to come up and replace it. Right, so who else is to blame here? Forestry, I don't know how the FSC cert comes, to, comes about, but most of our forests are just weed proliferation zones. This is honeysuckle and, again, privet spreading in the undergrowth. How can forestry be a sustainable industry if they are allowing weeds to spread across our landscape, bulk up seed source, and then destroy our national parks? This is, Chinese, uh, this is Taiwanese cherry. This is actually a plant that Doc promoted in their pamphlets back in the 80s. They said it was really good for the birds. Beautiful rata Pahutukawa hybrid forest in uh, the Bay of Plenty but surrounded by cherry invaded uh, forestry plantations. And I say this bit of forest here, I already have found cherry seedlings in it. Um, this is the rarest, most inland Pahutukawa forest on the planet. And we've got five, 10 years left until it's just destroyed by weeds. So moving on from forestry, I spoke about it before, but our roadsides are the corridors. This is the Dome Valley. You can see all the ginger flowering yellow. This is on Dockland in the Dome Valley. Uh, they've totally let it go. Uh, we've got key leadership positions in our department taken up by people that are either lazy or incompetent and don't want to address the problem. So it's a call for, it's a big wake up call. And this is a call for strong leadership because if we can lose the undergrowth of a forest to invasive deer and goats or pigs, we can also lose those regenerate, that ability for it to regenerate through plants like ginger. Yeah, here's another example. This is a, a bit of regenerating land, quite a lot of regenerating land down in Pudiota. So very close to some of the best seed sources for podocarp forest in the country. And this area was crown managed. I, this, I think they sold the cutting rights overseas. They, they logged it, Doc got the money out of it. Then there was no follow up done. So Pines have now taken it, wants to turn into Rimu, Kaikete, Matai, Tawa forest, but it's never going to. And so, you know, our government's forever in debt until they clean up these pines and every year they leave it, it gets more and more expensive and harder to do. 
what will our Southern Alps look after hearing Simon Upton speak and hearing the you know, reduction of funding on um, doing pine control. We, we're just pretty much poking the bear, you know, we're taunting the beast by doing a 30 second spray and walk away job and then allowing the weeds to carry on again. What will our Southern Alps look like when pines have run their course? This is just another classic roadside landscape where it has been left to go rewild and the reality is our native plants cannot compete. We've got arum lily, we've got ivy growing up the poplars, we've got old man's beard in there, a little bit of honeysuckle. That's only four species of what, there's 20,000 introduced plants into this country, maybe 30,000, and versus 2,000 New Zealand plants. We re they really need our help. This is Tarawera Landing, dock land on the side of Lake Tarawera, uh, hectares and hectares, maybe hundreds of hectares of Japanese honeysuckle. Do we want gully forests? Is that something that we would like to keep as a nation, as our identity, having forests? Because at the moment, when we're letting weeds run their course, we're eliminating all these, all these things that really give us our sense of belonging and our identity. Bit of morning glory for you. And uh, yeah, this sort of to debunk the theory of once you've got your canopy established, once you've got your forest there, you're pretty much safe from weeds. This is on the Coromandel. You've got a little pull over here where someone's decided to throw out some of their garden waste, which I think should be a jailable offence at the least. And uh, the, the uh, uh, jasmine has jumped out of their car there and spread into the bush and no one's doing anything about it. I actually pulled over up the road and dropped a quick knapsack Oh, just to try and control some vines, but you can see what this vine will do in one year, then it goes to seed, can have thousands of seeds, then next year, next year. You're looking at, look, you're looking at hundreds of hectares with guys two metres apart with knapsacks to try and spot spray and find every single last bit of jasmine, and that's not even a, one of the worst vines, it's quite tame. Um, you can still buy jasmine on the internet. In fact, the nursery... Um, the nursery shops, I refer to them as the meth lab of the problem. They are the weed distribution centres and we need to get serious because they're still pulling plants into the country and selling them for a quick buck, putting the costs onto us. Agapanthus, really annoying plant, still bringing out variations of it. Uh, periwinkle, look, they'll send it to anywhere around the country. So yeah, just a couple of key points to focus on facing the weed tsunami. We need a big wake up call. We need to make weeds a top priority. We need a full blown weed strategy at a national level as well as at regional levels. And these strategies need to be effective and meaningful. Otherwise, we might as well just give up. We need a change in dedication. We need to train up and value weed warriors, people who are dedicated to eradication, not just you know control. We want local eradications. And yeah, try not to spend money on sporadic control, just like a dog chasing its tail. Uh, the accountability, we need to make our conservation department and uh, our agencies with public money, like uh, regional councils or iwi groups, people that are looking after these spaces, we need to make them focused and accountable. And we need serious investment. We need realistic, sustained weed control funding. Uh, no more 30 second spray and walk away mentality. Every dollar that we spend now saves us hundreds. And if we don't act, the future generation, they won't be able to clean this up. The problem will be too big. So I'll leave you with a picture of the huia. Our forebearers failed to act. They knew there was a problem. We lost. Uh, one of the most beautiful birds, and we're only waking up to pest animals now, and you know the risk that they've we've lost a lot of birds like the huia. So what what we risk to lose now is not just a few birds, but our entire forest ecosystems and the ability for our forests to regenerate our country. So thank you very much.